So I guess I'm out of the book club. was awesome i love lost hi everybody welcome to book club for october today is october 30th um happy early halloween uh and we're talking about slaughterhouse five today and i'm really excited because i love this book um we're gonna start off with i just did a quick presentation kind of going into the author and then dresden and then we'll get the whole panel up. We've got a bunch of people today, which is awesome. And we'll talk about it. So I'm going to try to share my screen and hope everything works. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, we're good. All righty. Yes, okay, so. I like this cover a lot. I wish that my book had come with this one, but it sure didn't. Um, so here we go. Kurt Vonnegut uh, was born in Indianapolis in 1922. And while he was at Cornell University in 1943, he left and joined the army to serve in World War II. This is him when he was young. Um, during his service, he was a POW. He got captured at the Battle of the Bulge, and he was a survivor of the firebombing of Dresden in 1945, a couple months before the war officially ended. And then he went to graduate school at the University of Chicago and studied anthropology, which I find interesting considering his fiction works deal a lot with human nature and free will, honesty, that kind of stuff. Um, he, before he started writing fiction, he worked as a public relations writer and he hated it because it was very deceitful. Obviously PR is all about the spin. So he switched to full-time fiction writing. Uh, he wrote 14 novels, three short stories, uh, three short, short, short story collections, five plays, five nonfiction works. Um, he's really, he's considered one of the better modern uh, authors from America and satire, gallows humor, black humor, and science fiction. But he always puts a really interesting spin on it. And he died in 2007 in New York. Um, and out of all of those 14 novels he wrote, we're going to talk about this one. It was also made into a movie, which I will be honest, I haven't seen yet. I was gonna, I was gonna look for it, didn't have time, but um, it was released in 1972, which is really not long after the novel at all. Uh, and they had to film it mostly in Minnesota and the Czech Republic because Dresden ended up in East Germany and. We obviously didn't have access to go over there and film movies. So it's it's interesting that they had to film it in a completely different country. Um, but of the film, Vonnegut said it was a flawless translation of his novel. So I will watch it. And if anybody in the panel has seen it, we'll have to they'll have to tell me if it's good. Um in 2020, they released a graphic novel, which I'm actually really bummed out about because I read this book in 2019 for the first time, and I had no idea until I was looking for pictures that there's a graphic novel of it, but it looks really good. Um, and on to Slaughterhouse Five. Okay, so uh, this is what Kurt Vonnegut said in the second uh, printing he added this to the introduction it says the Dresden atrocity tremendously expensive and meticulously planned was so meaningless. Finally, that only one person on the entire planet got any benefit from it. I am that person. I wrote this book, which earned a lot of money for me and made my reputation such as it is one way or another. I got two or $3 for every person killed some business I'm in. Um, so, okay. And so this I found, 
a bunch of stuff about the before and after pictures and stuff. So this is Dresden circa 1900. Um, a really, really beautiful city. Uh, kind of unique architecture. And all right, cool. This is a newsreel. So it's pretty short. It's only like a minute and a half, but about the bombing. RAF heavy bombers assist Marshal Cognier's drive into the Reich. The target is Dresden. It was being used to pump German troops into counterattacks against the Russian army not many miles to the east. This strike put a stop to that. The night sky is pitted with aircraft, very colored target markers, and the newest German ac act device, a scarecrow designed to burst and look like a plane exploding after a direct hit. Static electrical discharge caused by intense cold mars these magnificent bombing shots. day after the RAF strike at Dresden, B-17 bombers of the 8th United States Air Force gave the city a repeat performance. After these attacks, the German overseas news agency said, this city, hitherto almost untouched, has been carpeted by heavy and super heavy high explosives and incendiaries. Dresden is a heap of ruins. It has been smashed to atoms. Before these attacks, Dresden was planned as a substitute capital in place of Berlin. After this, Hitler will have to look for a substitute for the substitute. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and that's pretty much what was released to the public for a really long time. Uh, I found an American version, same thing. So the British and the Americans released the same basic newsreel footage about it. Um, and this is Dresden in the aftermath. If you're watching on a small screen and can make it bigger, it, it's a pretty powerful picture. Uh, when the bombing happened, there were about at least a million people living in Dresden because a lot of refugees or fleeing from the Russians, or coming from other cities that had been destroyed. So there were a lot of people living there. Um, there's another view of just the, I mean, the buildings are basically just shells in the aftermath. Um, okay, so this is a before and after. Same here. Um, and then this is a good example of a building that they didn't fix for a really long time. Ivy takes a while to grow that thick, so you can tell that it just sat there as a ruin. This is a pile of cars and motorcycles that were burnt out, and they just kind of piled everything in the middle of the city at first to get rid of it. Um, and then this is this is much later. This is during the Soviet Union era in East Germany. And this building, uh, they just didn't fix it. I mean, this was an iconic building in Dresden. It was the Versailles of Dresden. The king that built it wanted to make a statement. He really wanted to make De Dresden the jewel of Europe. So he built this incredible building and it just got absolutely demolished. Um, and then after the fall of the Soviet Union, the UK and the US helped finance rebuilding some of the most iconic structures that were destroyed. And this is after it, we, it was rebuilt. Um, let's see. Hold on. I'm looking at my notes. Oh. There we go. Okay. So this is Augustus the Strong. He was the ruler in the 18th century. And it was his idea to create the Versailles of Dresden. He really wanted to put Dresden on the map with the other European capitals. Um. 
so in the process, he hired some of the finest jewelers, metal workers, and artists to work around the clock to create a royal collection of artifacts to rival the other European monarchs who had, you know, centuries worth of stuff accumulated. He wanted to catch up to them, so he certainly did. Um, before the bombing of Dresden, Hitler sent photographers to document this building because he was worried something might happen to it. And he even figured if it were destroyed, he'd rebuild it. So we used the pictures that his photographers took when we helped them fix it. And this is what it looks like in the aftermath. Let's see that. So this is oh, be back before we bombed it. And then this is now. Um, this ceiling was completely gone, but we had pictures and they commissioned artists to come in and recreate it and apparently they've done a really good job i couldn't find any pictures of the original but you can only imagine how difficult it was to find somebody that could paint like that in the mid 2000s and it was um apparently a lot of it had this green theme and people likened it to like the emerald city uh, and the nickname of this building is the Green Vault because it housed the royal collection and there was a lot of green. Uh, this is a blank on the word. It's a diorama. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> this diorama of a market cost more to make than this palace that the same king had built, which is pretty impressive considering it fits on a tabletop. Um, and this is a, a closer picture of it. I mean, the detail is incredible. Everything's covered in jewels and gold. Uh, you can see it here a little bit better. I mean, even the, the little guy leading the camel, I mean, his tunic has designs on it and just absolutely amazing i mean we don't make things like that anymore uh and then there's there are galleries online where you can look at a lot of this stuff but there's a lot of stuff that you know is showing other parts of the world um just really gorgeous and the only reason this collection survived is because they moved it out of Dresden to a fortress when the war started. And then the Red Army found it and they took it. And it wasn't until 2005 that after tons of negotiations and after the Green Vault was rebuilt that they got this collection back. And now it's on display. It's a museum. This ship is, I mean, absolutely incredible. Apparently the sails are super thin and it's made out of ivory which i know is sad but you know different world back then uh this tea set is just completely covered in diamonds and gold so you know he wanted to rival the other european rulers and i would say he definitely gave them a run for their money but funny story is that in 2019 let me get to my note here. Yeah. Okay. So in November of 2019, thieves pulled off a, a heist and they stole a billion euros, which is $1.1 billion, depending on when you look that stat up right now, I guess. But a billion euros worth of priceless, really, artifacts from this museum. And... Really, they're irreplaceable, so putting a price tag on them is kind of hard. But in 2021, six men were arrested. Two of them were already in prison for another heist in Germany. And nothing had ever been recovered. Uh, I got pictures. This is what was stolen. Um, I mean, just covered in jewels. But... Uh, like, look at the hilt on this thing. It's totally, 
<laughs> you don't think it would be very useful, but gosh, these things are like so incredible. It's funny from an American perspective because we don't have anything like this. We don't have some artifact from history that's just crusted in gems and diamonds and gold. So it's always funny to see this. Um, but this is a green diamond, that teardrop in the bottom part. And they believe the heist was really after that, but it was on loan. And it was with the Hope Diamond in New York City when they robbed the place. So this survived, luckily. Um, let's see, I think it's like 40, let me see, 41 carat green diamond. I mean, it's, it's like the Hope Diamond. There's nothing else like it on Earth. Um, oops. And that is the story of Dresden and, you know, just the basic history, the back and forth. And, you know, just Dresden isn't something I ever heard about in any of my classes. They really just kind of skipped over this part. And it's such a beautiful city. It's very sad that it was just completely demolished. But it looks like they're trying to pull back the culture that they had and bring back, back some of the glory. So with that, we can switch over to... I don't know how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So yeah, we can do the panel. Hello, everybody. All right. Okay. So I just want to start with this quote. Um, and it's about Alex is going to have to tell me how to say the name of the aliens because I, when I don't know how to say a word when I'm reading, I just skip it. <laughs> just, so how do you say it, Alex? The Tralfomadorians. Tralfom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tralfomadorians. So I'm basing is, that off of the audiobook. So I don't. I, I, okay. I mean, and that's Franco's reading. I don't know. <laughs> that definitely works for me. Um. Okay, so this quote is at the beginning of chapter five, and it's when Billy is looking at their novels, and it's just a bunch of symbols and clumps. And so it says, each clump of symbols is a brief, urgent message describing a situation, a scene. We travel from Adorians, read them all at once, not one after the other. There isn't any particular relationship between all the mess messages, except that the author has chosen them carefully so that when seen all at once they produce an image of life that is beautiful and surprising and deep there is no beginning no middle no end no suspense no moral no causes no effects what we love in our books are the depths of the many marvelous moments seen all at one time so with that um I'll make one comment on that. So yeah. the Tralfadorians, they live in all time simultaneously. So yes. part of the book, they talk about the difference between how humans observe time and how Tralfadorians observe time. Mm -hmm. So to them, a book, like you can have all these different parts of a book. They absorb it all at once simultaneously and understand it all. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what order they're in. Right. So you have to wrap your head around that. And when I was reading that, I thought, oh, that's why the chapters are this way in this book, because it's the same with his book. <laughs> it's like a Tralfadorian book. I Absolutely. read, I listened to it twice and I got confused the first time. The uh -huh. second time through, I just went back and I I think I've listened to the whole thing entirely again. But it doesn't matter which chapter you listen to first. The order is completely random. You just pick one and read it. it is, I, it's, I don't know. That was just my thought. I wonder if he's th writing it like a Tralfadorian book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it definitely, it, it's just, a total splatter like he just took everything and threw it against the wall but it works i mean when you're when you're done you have the whole picture even though you got it in different pieces um does anybody else have anything they want to say on I, that i don't think it's quite how they would view things because like for example like the problem is is that it's from his perspective and he is a human being unstuck in time so like as far like it's as much as a human being can conceptualize not experiencing linear time 
we, but we can't experience everything at the same moment. We're not capable of that and neither is he. So I think it's, it's like this in between existence where in your, um, you can't quite grasp what moment you're in, but so he's forever moving around through time. And I think uh, so, to some extent, that's a, like a metaphor for his, the trauma of having mm-hmm. been in war, I would say. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I kind of picked up on that too, Keith. There was that um, kind of section of the book where he asked to see the the aliens book. I'll just call them the aliens for simplicity's <laughs> sake. But uh, yeah, I'm like, I feel like this is inserted in there specifically to explain why he's writing the book this way. You know, which I don't know. to me, it kind of felt a little bit like a cop out. It, it's almost as if the character, you know, Billy Pilgrim, because of his war experience and what happened after, he does actually exist that way. And and in his mind, he flips back to all these different things. Like he's in Dresden in the in, you know, locked up, and then he's on Trafador, and then he's back with his wife during the honeymoon. And like that's what his brain is. He said he said he like wakes up in the hospital in Vermont or something, right? Like from mm-hmm. he falls asleep in the prison and he wakes up in Vermont. Like so yeah. he's almost living that way. Yeah, I thought that would have been like more interesting, like a more interesting explanation for it. Like, you know, because of his war trauma, that's, you know, how he experiences things and like maybe flashes back and stuff like that. But it, like they, he says that it's because of the plane crash, you know, not because of the war trauma. So, well, I mean, the thing is, though, is that he there's two types of trauma that our main character is experiencing. The first one is the trauma of having experienced war and the bombing of Dresden. And the second one is brain trauma, actual brain trauma. So uh, in that regard, and it's something his daughter brings up, why didn't you, you never talked about the aliens before the plane crash. You only talk about them after you went through this plane crash. Uh, Even though he says the aliens picked him up um earlier than that um and the and the thing is though so to me i'm sort of like even like the brain trauma of the plane crash means that he could believe that the aliens exist but they don't actually and that his his ptsd flashbacks and his brain his actual brain trauma flashbacks are making it impossible for him to distinguish what is real and what isn't real um, so it, because it is first person though, for like pretty much, it's pretty di- directly in Billy's head, even though, uh, it's like limited third, we could say that there's no, like, that might not be the answer that one that Billy has. The answer might be bigger than that, that it's just, he, his brain is broken and he doesn't have a better answer. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like from a storytelling perspective, like because he had already experienced trauma from war, uh, like there wasn't really a need to like insert a second trauma to explain why he's experienced time in this way. Like it could have been like, you know, he had been shelled by a bomb in Dresden or something could have been that that could have been like the the genesis of it all. So like to me, like the whole like, having these conversations with the aliens seemed like kind of a, almost a lazy way of like talking directly to the reader instead of like um, communicating to the reader through storytelling. Also um, loads of the different elements that he experiences from the trial Famadorians and his um, like, abduction and taken to their home world and put in a zoo and they're all part of um like plot lines from uh, kilgore trout novels as well so it seemed like it was trying to suggest that maybe um his whole world view about the alien abduction and um his um becoming a maud from time um it could just be him just feeding back um, what he's read in trashy paperback novels. Yeah, it's like, that's kind of where I landed with the whole thing is that after the plane crash, 
it just kind of jumbled everything. And so he kind of, his brain concocted this new incident to explain all of his trauma. And it included elements from various things, the books he was reading and his experience. Like, um, for instance, the day that he's abducted, He's outside in the backyard looking at the wedding tent and it's orange and black. And that scene is right after he's on the cattle cars as a POW. And he says those are marked with orange and black stripes so that, the you know, planes won't bomb them. They're not fair game. And similarly like in that same sequence when he's first going to the planet like he's being put in a zoo and that's right after describing what it's like at the real like where all the real carts are and they're being loaded in to cattle cars and there's a paragraph in there where he suddenly said he said calls himself and everyone else human beings like three or four times in a short number of sentences, which I think was kind of like it, it's that parallel. Like he's put in a zoo on a planet, but being loaded into cattle cars and treated like animals makes you feel the same sort of way. And it's like his brain didn't want the traumatic memory. So then it made it better. Like, okay, well, but the aliens treat you so well, like you're, you know, they think you're a great specimen instead of being a weakling soldier that gets caught right away. The, the day that they, they find a mate for him and Brigham, it says that's the highest attendance in all history for the zoo. You know, <laughs> yeah. People come. I love the other part of the, just for people that didn't read it, the, the, the zoo that he's in, one of the things they do with Americans is they have this, they tell them that they're going to return them to earth someday and they have a fake stock market. And so the entertainment for the visitors to come is to watch the Americans like trading and every once in a while they make them win. So then they get all excited. Like that's yeah. the, that's the <laughs> zoo set up. It's hilarious. It is. <laughs> and it's true. I love uh -huh. how he developed, like, I for, I don't even know how many books are in there. There's the other one about the visitor from outer space, which is this alien comes and he's trying to figure out Christianity and he decides the whole purpose of Christianity is don't kill somebody that's got, you know, power and is well known. Like if you're going to kill somebody, make sure no one really cares. So it's like Christianity is like, oops, yeah, we shouldn't have killed this guy. Uh -huh. like, like that's the whole purpose of Christianity. But any, I don't, but there's a bunch a lot more of, that he um, developed. He uses a lot of repeating metaphors. I mean, the most obvious one is so it goes, which, mm -hmm. um, he uses after every time somebody dies or is injured or something terrible happens and um, like you were saying about the uh, the orange and black so don't get bombed and then linking that image in with um other memories that are significant to billy pilgrim and um, it's certainly a way that he like kind of throws like a scattergun out and then keeps drawing little uh, connections back right which I think works really well. I mean, what really struck me was uh, in the first chapter when he is uh, talking about his visit to O'Hare and um, his old war buddy, um, Vonnegut's old war buddy, and his wife that doesn't like him. And he makes it clear, and this is also another callback, um, that it's going to be uh, the childhood crusades he's going to tell the story of, not like some uh, thrusting, action-packed um, war novel that glorifies the pain and the death and what have you, which <clears throat> I thought was, uh, yeah, pretty indicative of what he was trying to do with um, the book because it, it doesn't glorify anything. There's not one single likable character in the whole book. They're all um, either reprehensible <laughs> or detestable in some way or another. Um, but the what comes out of it, the end of it, is still relatively uplifting. And, yeah, you're aware that 139,000 people died in this single um, part of one conflict, but it has nowhere near the um, resonance that, um, for example, Hiroshima does, which he highlights is only like it's only 79,000 people. When it comes down to putting human lives on a little tally like that, you look at the absurdity and the horror of it and like, okay, you've done more there with very, very little than, you know, describing loads of bombs and um, 
daring do and massive action or what have you. He said in the book that yeah, more people were killed in the Dresden firebombing than Hiroshima and Nagasaki individually. Like I didn't know that. I didn't even know about Dresden. Like and right. Juliet said the same thing. Like, I don't know. I went to a state run university. They didn't mention this. I don't think so I wait, never man, heard is this not taught in the in the States at um, at high school then? Well, there's not, a lot of stuff not taught. Yeah, in, definitely in or, or college. Sure. Yeah. Well, and see, the thing is, I think I knew about it when history students at my college didn't know about it because I read this book for grad school. So to me, uh, like, I think at this point, English students have a higher likelihood of knowing about Dresden than history students, which is kind of messed up. Right. Well, I wanted yeah, to... Go back to Matt real quick and ask him, like, because you said you mentioned there was some part of it towards the end that was uplifting, and I might have missed that. So, what was it that you found uplifting? Uh, okay, so I mean, uplifting is maybe not quite right, but um, it's it's just the way it is um, laced with such um, humor and his. And descriptive language, the way that he can like write an entire character in uh, one simple sentence, um, like describing um, a, like woman's IQ and then bodily form, and you're like, okay, you've just described someone that you can envision, and that is in one sentence. It's not very nice. You don't think um, well of the person describing um, that woman or the woman themselves, but um, the the wry humour in it um <clears throat> is more um uplifting than say the relentless description of 139,000 people being burnt alive so yeah more more of the um more of the way he has constructed the novel rather than it actually being um like um a cheery old read he he does portray this and the Trafagorians have it and maybe he Trafagorians and maybe he's advice is to live that way but you just like they know that they're going to destroy the universe because somebody's going to start you know their spaceship experiment and it's going to destroy the universe and it's always happened because they already know and his like the whole message of the book is uh, i'd summarize it in two things like war is stupid totally stupid and so it goes and so, <laughs> you so just it live. Goes. so it goes like that's i wrote down in my notes this is the summary of the book war is stupid so it goes Mm -hmm. That's what I wrote well, down for a summary. I feel like a lot of it is about your inability to control the world around you and maybe even yourself to some extent. Because, like, it, Billy has no control over himself or his life, especially with him going back and forth and everything. If you take it from the literal sense that he's right and he is moving through time, he has no control. <clears throat> um, but if you take it even from the psychological standpoint, he still doesn't have any control. And he's even with doctors in his life not able to gain control so it it feels like a lot of this is about how in that saying so it goes is that you're just gonna things bad things are gonna happen and it, you have to keep going and that's about it like it, in I, I mean a lot of people would probably say see that as like extremely negative and dark and everything and it's like well i mean it, it's true whether or not you accept it so accepting it is not a bad thing that, oh, bad things happen in the world and you have to deal with it. Like, it's it, it's just more facing reality, I suppose, which is not a bad thing. You should do that. And I don't think Billy is facing reality as much as he should be, honestly. Well, it's but it's the same for everybody. Uh, it's I don't the think same Billy for everybody, even though, understands. No one... Go ahead. I was going to say he doesn't even understand what reality is. Like he's not even. It's like he's not quite sure sometimes because he could be on Trafador and then he's in the prison, then he's with his wife, and then he's in the hospital, and then he's going to work or something. It's, and it all seems real. I think to the character Billy, everything is just as real. So just calling back to um, Alex's point um, about him not feeling in control, but it's the same. There's there's no one character or organization in the um, story that is in, in control. Um, he brings in that um, 
guy in his 70s, the ex-Air Force guy who's writing a single volume history of the uh, American um, Air Force. And he is trying to retcon um, like a structure around the firebombing of Dresden, um, even though he has someone who literally witnessed it there and he can't even hear what he's saying. Um, and it just shows that, you know, oh, yeah, we really needed to um, kill all of these people in this manner. And, you know, no one has control. When there's more than three moving parts, it's a complex system around which none of us have control. And that's what kind of what I took from um, his um, character of Billy Pilgrim and the um, format of the novel as well. Yeah. I feel like um, there are... Go ahead, Juliet. Oh, no, go ahead. You go first. I was just going to say, I feel like there are very two very conflicting messages from this book. The first is that, you know, it seems to be an anti-war book, which I don't know if I would have even picked up on if he hadn't told me specifically in the first chapter. And the other is that, you know, it feels very nihilistic where nothing matters. Everything that happens or will happen can't be changed. And so, yeah, war is stupid, but also trying to end war is equally stupid because you like he even go, you know, suggests that free will is a human contrivance contrivance that doesn't even exist. You know, um, when the, the aliens were saying, you know, we've explored hundreds of other planets and free will was only, you know, uh, a thing on earth, you know, which to me is, is like him suggesting like, yeah, there isn't really free will, you know, it's something that humans made up to maybe cope with their situation. I think the nihilism of it is, I mean, if I had to try and step in his shoes and see what Kurt Vonnegut thinks, or at least Kurt Vonnegut in the voice he's writing this book in, right? Because I, I don't know how much of this is his actual opinion. You can never assume that. Um, if I have to ask what perspective he's taking with it, the, the impression I'd get, because I read this book again recently, and I, I'd read it before when I was in high school. I, I just picked it up off the shelf at the library, I think. Um the impression I get is that Kurt Vonnegut is basically an absurdist, right? He doesn't seem to think there's any inherent meaning. It's very existential in that in, in that respect. So what he's what he's basically saying is since we don't have any grand things to kill or die for, let's just uh, try to make this as pleasant as possible. So even though he thinks everything is meaningless, there's still a basis for him being anti-war in the sense that that's kind of like a pointlessly violent. Because if you think about it, the only thing that would motivate people into warfare is the existence of some high ideal above comfort. Because if being comfortable is the most important thing, or pleasure is the most important thing, there's no reason to have warfare ever at all. You would have to be a complete pacifist. Even if somebody comes after you, it's probably easier to surrender, right? So if you are an absurdist or a nihilist, like Vonnegut seems to be in this book, then your natural response is going to be war is stupid because there's no good reason to do anything, especially not go to war. Yeah, that brings up a point, I, I like a good point I was going to mention because it's considered one of like the best anti-war books. Granted, it came out like during Vietnam, so people probably were reading it through a different lens maybe but like i agree i don't i wouldn't have ever said this is a super anti-war book maybe that it's uh, war realism um it's not a hero story where most war stories that people liked and still like are usually are kind of heroic in nature you know Saving Private Ryan style stuff, like people die, but they died for a good cause in a brave way. And in this book, people are not dying for good causes in brave ways. They're just dying left and right for like dumb reasons. Um, but it makes me think, um, kind of going into like the what Alex and I were saying about the whole double narrative thing that potentially this is just an older man who's brain is broken he had a lot of trauma he never processed and in that case the so it goes it's kind of a detachment right <clears throat> like Meh, shit happens like that kind of attitude towards death because he experienced so much of it and it was all so senseless 
that he kind of just, yeah, had to have that detached attitude towards it. Um, I, but I don't know. What are your thoughts? I mean, I saw it as being basically anti-war because like you said, the people in this book are not dying for a good cause, but I think the underlying message here is there are no good causes. Mm -hmm. And if there are no good causes, then the logical outcome of that is war is stupid. There's no reason to go to war because there's nothing worth fighting over. Mm -hmm. I see well, that. Um, go ahead, Alex. I was just going to say that it reminded me a lot of, it's, it's not something you read unless you really are an English major, um, but in uh, there was some American literature that came out right after the Civil War ended, a lot of poems and short stories that were incredibly gruesome, like it really, really horribly gruesome. They were not kind to war or what happens at, in war. And they were like, look at how these people died. Like even, even if you said this was for the greatest cause ever ending slavery, this was quite possibly one of the most horrific experiences one could ever imagine. And like, and it, they did not shy away from showing you the violence in these poems and short stories. And they're not popular and people don't read them today. It's not like the Charge of the Light Brigade where people actually like read that and think it's cool. Even though that one's about a really <coughs> horrific event uh, in war as well. But it reminded me of that. And I feel like a lot of soldiers who were in war, when they write about it, they don't write about it as this wonderful experience where they did something great for humanity, even if they were supposedly fighting for something amazing. They think about the horrific things that they saw that they can never unsee, that most of the world has never experienced. And they're trying through poetry and fiction to show us just how horrific it is. And, uh, and it seems like that happens every single time there's a conflict, like an actual war happens and people die. Like the people who come out of it actually, it's who actually experienced it, the things they write are so dark. And then most of the time, the, that fiction and poetry disappears from the popular lexicon. People don't keep reading it. This mm -hmm. one has managed somehow to stay above that phenomenon. And I think one of the reasons why it does is because um, of the weirdness of it. The fact that he, that they did, he did layer in that thing with the aliens and the being unstuck from time. People can look at it as a sci-fi novel, as opposed to this, look at how dark and horrible war is. So I think it, it that's from, from the perspective of how it can impact an audience. I definitely think those parts of the book need to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I was going to bring up like post-war literature and I'm, I really haven't formed my explanation for this yet. But I mean, Alex is right. Usually post-war people that actually fought in it, they're, they are like they, their literature tends to be darker. Um, but two huge exceptions to that. And not to say the stories aren't dark, but it's you know, the point of them is different. Um, uh, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis fought in World War One, and they came out and wrote these, like, epic stories that are fantasy, but where essentially the, like, bottom line is there's evil in the world that will try to take over, and but there's still good in the world, and that's worth fighting and giving everything for. Um, I mean, they're not, like, they, they're not super dark, but there's definitely an ominous feel to both stories. Um, but I just, I couldn't quite figure out why those two guys came out and created these stories that have lasted through generations at this point that are more not positive towards war, but that like war is going to happen. Bad people will bring it and that you have to fight back. Yeah. They're, they're optimistic and they, uh -huh. there's some hope there in their stories where this one really doesn't have any of that. And I, I can appreciate like the realism of the storytelling. Like sometimes you're a war hero and sometimes you just die in a ditch and nobody ever informs your family because 
you know, you're not discovered. But, you know, he never really, he never really balances it with anything, you know, that ever gives him any hope, like somebody telling him a joke or, you know, him finding, I don't know, a fucking pebble on the ground that like may, brings up some memory that was, you know, good to him or, you know, something mm-hmm. like that. So, um, yeah, it seems like he has very low value for human life. And like even the characters in the story, they don't really respond in any great way to like people dying, except for, you know, I guess his his wife was very, you know, uh, upset about him being in the plane crash. And that's really the strongest human emotion in the whole book. Mm-hmm. I yeah, think- it brings up a good point about Tolkien and Lewis is that they were both uh, Christians mm. who had, and that would have probably dramatically affected their view on war uh, <laughs> and the reasons right. behind the, why they went to war. I think not that only that, that you, but you go ahead, go for it. Okay, I was um, going to say I, both. Both, hey, sorry, we're, we're across the um, <laughs> pond it's, it's the, where we've got a bit delay. of delay going on here. It's the delay, yeah. that's what's doing it. Okay, okay, Matt, you go, and then I'll go. Okay, so with uh, Lewis and Tolkien, um, they bring a hell of a lot of religious iconography and imagery really directly into um, mm-hmm. the storytelling. So um, once you start bringing it up into that um, mythic range, I mean, that that's bands across time, across individuals, and um, that gives that um, vast sweep of time and encourages uh, the more romantic sort of view. Whereas when you're down and dirty in the, um, like basically a single human life that is shattered and broken, then it's pretty hard to find um, anything positive and um, sort of greater or complete about a war. Okay, Caleb, Mm -hmm. go for it. I was going to say, I think that there's, if, if you if you take an observation about human nature here, I think that a person's values are what compel them to do things, right? Like whatever you believe most deeply is going to, in your worldview, is going to inform your decisions on what is and is not worth doing. And that's why, for example, people who seem to recover better from war or seem to have a like a heroic view of it are people who have some deep seated belief. Now, in the case of Lewis and Tolkien, that's that's religion, but it doesn't have to be. You know, Camus fought for the French Resistance, and he was an atheist, but Camus had these very deeply, sort of passionately held convictions about human freedom and all this. And it was mm-hmm. it was those deep seated beliefs that caused him to recover the way he did because he saw meaning in it. I think with Vonnegut, the primary difference is the fact that he doesn't really have values. He's a nihilist. So for him, there's nothing worth fighting over because he doesn't have any values, and that's why there's no recourse for any of this. Well, there is only one. I said earlier that he was an absurdist, and I think, um, G-Man, what you were saying, how it, how there's never any blue sky anywhere, I think there actually is. In the way that he deals with all this is the absurdist route, which is finding it funny, just being ridiculous because there's nothing else to do. At the very least, I can say it's amusing. So let's talk about little green people with hands that are shaped like hands on plungers with eyes in their palm, because that at mm-hmm. least that's funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that helps the reader out, maybe balance it out for the reader. But I don't know if that really helped the character out. I, I don't know. Yeah, um, here, I'll bring up. Let's see. Carter commented in the private chat and he he was talking about the jumping back and forth between timelines and what effect that has on the reader and how would it be different if it was written linearly and I really hadn't thought about it that way I'm I like the craft of how he wove everything together out of order and how it still you get the whole picture of Billy Pilgrim's life um, I thought that was kind of masterful, but if you think about it, if you really started at the beginning and went to the end, I think this would be a very, very sad book where like the way it's written, it's kind of laughable how everything always goes wrong and everybody's always dying. I mean, he wrote it that way on purpose, but if you start at the beginning and go straight to the end, 
of the events, I just, I can only imagine it would just be like, you've got to be kidding. Like now his wife is dead. <laughs> like Now he's in a plane crash. He's just like, he can't catch a break and his life gets worse and worse over time. But the way it's written kind of breaks that effect up a little bit. And, and then he goes on to explain that he never really liked his wife anyway. <laughs> he didn't want to marry her because she was ugly. <laughs> he didn't want to marry her, but yeah, she was ugly and she was nasty. And so when she died, you know, when she comes in <laughs> to the hospital, when he's in the hospital, uh -huh. she, he reports their whole conversation in detail. And it's like, it's like you're talking to a doctor or something mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's nothing like I miss you. Can't wait to your home. Are you okay? Like none of that. It's just... <laughs> Right. Hello. You know, the funny thing is the only time he shows any emotion over death or kind of any huge thing is the horse at the very end of the book when he's uh, in Dresden and he looks at the horses that makes him cry because they're in such a pitiful condition. So that's while one of he's the... gathering bodies to burn them. Yeah. What well, yeah, the, the, I that's highlighted like the that two one. times he reports crying in the whole book. Yeah. In his life. Yeah, it's this strongest emotional reaction that he his character experiences through the whole thing and he outlines that and it is just one again it's one small short encapsulated sentence and um there you go it's, it's given and it's not about the people it's not about the circumstance it's about two horses but you know just by describing their um bleeding mouths and hooves you're like oh right okay yeah, you've yeah. got that image fully formed in your mind and you can see why it would um, sponsor someone to feel strong emotion. But that's it. That's what is the, the biggest thing that you'll feel in this entire uh, story. Nah. Yeah. Well, do you think, Caleb, do you think that's part of the absurdity is that, you know, the strong emotion is reserved for animals and not human beings? Or what's your take on that? Um, I, I think that could be part of the absurdity, but the my first reaction to that, like if you, I don't have a reason for this, it's just like a subjective reaction, is that that's meant to drive home the pointlessness and smallness of everything. Mm -hmm. the, the smallness, especially like here I am in this horrible bombed out place and everybody's dead, et cetera. And then I saw some poor sad horses and cried over them the end. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just meant to drive home how futile and pointless all this is that it's that, that, that the most we get is the guy cries over a horse. Because if you think about it, I, I mean, if what Vonnegut is trying to do is make everything seem pointless, he's not going to allow it to be grand and sorrowful. He's not going to let that happen. He's not mm -hmm. going to have this guy even have an existential crisis over his comrades. You can't even see him as comrades. These guys around me are a bunch of fucking assholes too, right? <laughs> um, so the most he can allow to happen, he wants some pathos, but it needs to be something sort of insipid in order to make the, in order to maintain the tone of the book. So crying over some horses is the best he can do. I would have to say that I think people react strongly to um, both children and animals getting hurt because of the fact that they have less perceived free will in involved in situations. And also, um, Billy took part in the damage that the horses felt. It wasn't like he found these horses. He they were you he was part of the group of people who were using these horses to death essentially. Mm -hmm. And that made and I think that's some guilt there. Um and then like so it's kind of like horrible. Like you know you're a human being and you're t you're taking part in this war even though like you don't have a lot of choice about it. But at the same time, horses have even less choice about what they're doing. Uh, and you know that. And to, I think part of it was how he, in that moment, he realized how desensitized he was to the horror, you know, like when he, that he didn't even notice that the horses were this hurt for so mm -hmm. long. And then like it hit him that like, oh, wow, I, I like, I can't see these things anymore, essentially. That it's, and I think part of it was like a loss of his own innocence that it, and his loss of his like sense of how things should work in the world. But at the same time, he is wearing um, silver boots, a toga, and a muff on his hands. So any <laughs> emotional resonance or um, 
sense of um, human connection is diluted by the fact that you think he looks like a, a parody. I mean, the uh, two obstetricians, um, the two German obstetricians that he meets, look at him and just like, what the fuck are you? You know, like you're dressed like mocking. <laughs> he throws in a bit of casual racism about um, the Poles as well, thinking he might be Polish, but um, there's there's no build up to any of um, these like strong emotional tones. It's all like fragmented in the same way the narrative is by um, like just pulling loose on all of the threads, how the character is portrayed and um, how it's experienced by others. So much of the whole he looks ridiculous stuff doesn't come off as funny to me, like, at all. It comes off as pathetic. Like, things are so bad, he can't even, like, he doesn't even have the decency he afforded him to not look like a clown. And so to me, that's not funny. And it's not, it doesn't make it funny that, oh, if I saw this, I would laugh. Like, no, I would actually be, like, holy crap, this is, like, that bad that you can't even, like, wear real clothes. Like, you can't even find them. Like, to, that's my perspective on the weirdness of his outfits during, like, all the Dresden stuff. Mm -hmm. it, like, you know, like, even when the Germans put him in the really tiny coat and everything, all that stuff, it doesn't feel funny at all. It just feels pathetic. And so much of the lack of high emotion to me feels much more like Kafka wherein it's depressive, it's not sad, it's not sensationalist, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be depressing, and it absolutely is depressing. And so to me, this understated value works better for showing you just how horrible everything is, as opposed to, you know, Uncle, Tom ca Uncle Tom's Cabin kind of, you know, sensationalist purple prose over how sad things are and how oh it's such a tragedy like mm -hmm. the under like that kind of thing like undercuts the reality of how horrible things can get and yeah some things are so ridiculous in the real world that you would laugh but it's not funny it's it's absolutely not funny i guess maybe that's a different perspective <laughs> hey it's part of the dehumanizing that he's describing for being uh -huh. a pow and what you eventually get to and the character billy like he just deals with it and they're laughing at him and he doesn't even recognize they until he's in with the british when he goes to the uh, british pow compound and the, the british goes oh me that is just not proper at all they're <laughs> trying to make fun of you and he's like objects and that's when Billy realizes what they're doing. It's like he doesn't even notice. It's part of being a POW. Uh -huh. That absurdism, I mean, though, yeah, um, that has um, hints back to um, like Catch Twenty Two and um, Heller's evocation of um, War and that, where th some of these things are so ridiculous that it's it's not funny, but. Um, the lack of seriousness in the circumstance is what generates the kind of feeling that you know this this is as alex was saying it's, um so pathetic and uh, horrific but it's generated by means of um these little images rather than um by outright stating it um and it, and it's I think it's also a little culture thing. He's throwing a little dig, you know, of like the average American versus the average British. Like a British POW, just they would object. They would say, "No, sir, you should not do that. That's not proper war stuff." Right? And the American just goes along. Well, I, I think at that. that point, even if he had noticed he was being made a clown, like he wouldn't even care because his sole focus is on surviving, and like when he gets to the British camp, like he goes into kind of great detail of how they have had hoarded like tons of food and cigars and stuff. So like they're in a better position to like think about those sorts of things that are really a luxury, like your own and, dignity in a time of war. And the whole thing is caused by a mistake from the Red Cross. So they were sending them 500 tons a month instead of 50 tons for four years straight. Yeah, it, it's funny. I mean, I don't know, funny is not really the right word. The Russians are all starving. Russia doesn't mm -hmm. have a Red Cross during World War II sending pw's food and the and it's just a paper it's a clerical error you said and that's why the british 
live in this POW camp for four years and they're fine. Does anybody know if that part's true? I don't. It's I mean, one I'm of the sure many the things Red I wanted Cross, to look up. Yeah, I'm sure the Red Cross has made mistakes before. So maybe that's an exaggeration of the truth, if nothing else. It's, it's plausible. <laughs> and Red Cross did send POWs food in World War II. Like that uh -huh. part's true. Anyway, yeah, th there's so many things in this. I mean, I didn't even know until uh, right before the show, I looked up to see if he really was in the war. I preferred, like, I didn't know anything about this. I don't know anything about Dresden. I, I did never read a Kurt Vonnegut book. Um, I, re I just read it and I wanted to on purpose. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't listen to any of the chatter. I just read it. I never looked anything up. And it wasn't until I f got through it twice that I even started checking. And that's why I have this book. Like, one of the first things I do is, like, the next book I'm reading, I definitely want to read something from Trail. So that, yeah. that's, what the, that's what this cover is. I looked that one up. You can get that one, Venus on the Half Shell. And it's it's nineteen dollars <laughs> in paperback and and forty for the the hardback. Wow! And the other thing I found today, trying to find them up on Goodreads, it's a bumper sticker in a in a, a book called The Complete Works of Kilgore Trout. <laughs> a bumper sticker. I'd rather be reading Kilgore Trout. <laughs> if you want, I just thought like you want a really subtle, hilarious bumper sticker for my scooter. But anyway, it turns out that. That isn't true either. But I didn't know until the end. I thought maybe Israel, because he developed the Kilgore Trout story so well. Like he right. he thought through it enough that he could have wrote those books. Yeah, I was kind of curious about that too as I was reading. It's like how much of this is, you know, pulled from real life. How much is it's an exaggeration, and how much is like totally made up? Because it's, it's hard to tell, really. It's hard to tell. I, I looked right before the show. I looked up to see what his real wife's name was to see if that's part's real. Like, I, who knows? You can't tell from reading it. And some of it is true. It's a history lesson wrapped up in this other stuff. So. Well, the, there's a point in the book wherein, so like he's constantly, it's third person referring to Billy like all the time, you know, and but a mm -hmm. very close limited third. But at one point he goes, and that was me reader, like he says uh -huh. he's someone else in the story so it's in it, it's kind of it's such a brief moment like if you forgot of like if you didn't if you weren't paying attention or something you might miss it but like i love those kinds of writers who who throw that who just one little reference in there like aha the narrator is this person and you might totally forget about it but yeah so he's someone else in this story there, there's so much detail of the history that even without me looking it up, I realized partway through the book that he is the one that was in Dresden. I was pretty sure he really was in Dresden, like uh -huh. that that part was true. And turns out it was. Right. Isn't it wild that in the first chapter, um, he says that he I think I wrote the quote down. Um yeah, okay. I, I wrote the Air Force back then asking for details about the raid on Dresden, Dresden. Who ordered it? How many planes did it? Why they did it? What desirable results there had been and so on. I was answered by a man who, like myself, was in public relations. He said that he was sorry, but that the information was top secret still. I read the letter out loud to my wife and I said, secret? My God, from who? Can you imagine being in that scenario, like like being in Dresden, witnessing all of that, helping clean up afterwards, and then the Air Force won't even give you any statistics on it because it's top secret, even though you, you didn't even know it was secret. Um, which kind of leads me into one of the other questions I kind of, I don't know, it's not like a question that's super easy to answer, but it's like the, the why did we hide it if it was justified the fact that the um, allies firebombed Dresden it's something that yeah in America I don't I took two classes on World War II specifically in history classes in college and we didn't even talk about this they they don't want to bring it out. Yeah, I took yeah. American. I didn't take one specifically in World War II, but I took several history classes mm -hmm. that covered World War II extensively. 
I recognize it as a name. Like I didn't know it was in East Germany or West Germany. I know anything about it. And I've been to Germany six times. Well, I didn't even, I don't know anything yeah. about this. <laughs> well, it's the really Alpics, go- isn't it? There was yeah. a change yes. in, in military doctrine since, since World War II, because in World War II, we had this notion that you could break someone's will to fight by basically bombing them into submission. And you mm-hmm. see this. There's, there's a quote by, by Churchill where he uh, straight up says, we're just bombing Germany to increase for the sole reason of increasing the terror. There was no military justification or strategic reason why we were just bombing them to basically to try and immiserate them into submission. Um, it, it, the idea was to tear, it was essentially terrorism, basically. And I think that what, that what changed in military doctrine in the world over after World War II is when we realized, oh, hey, that doesn't work. Bombing people over and over again like that tends to just piss them off. It doesn't actually break their will. So when we bombed Dresden, it was, it was, you know, it was basically just bloodthirst, right? It was just an excuse to incinerate a city full of people, but it was justified by the military doctrine of the time. So after the fact, when we realize, oh, wait, that doesn't work. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Dresden. What? Dresden? What, what are you talking about? Because it's no longer justified because military doctrine has changed. So that could be part of it. Well, I mean, it doesn't work if you half-ass it. If you totally annihilate your enemies, then I guess it works. But... Well, that yeah. never happens, though. You, unless you actually kill every single person in Germany, it doesn't... Yeah. Um, I, 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 I was... question... Go ahead, Keith. Go ahead. I, I was just going to question this. Um, I'm, I am old enough to remember the shock and awe campaign in Iraq. Like, I think... The United States military still has this as part of their normal agenda. Um, That's a very short-lived thing, though. That's something we do right off the bat is to try and get a quick victory. This idea of doing it over and over until they eventually break is what went out of fashion. And also the uh, shock and awe. The shock and awe was um, hidden under the veil of uh, surgical strikes and all of the... um, attacks were focused on uh, military targets rather than uh, the civilian population um, for uh, Desert Storm. Um, the, this whole kind of like just bombing the civilian population back to the Stone Age um, and out of existence. I mean, that, that's a very, very short-lived military te- tactic. Um, Pre-World War One, pre-mechanized uh, warfare, um, war took place mostly between armies unless it was a um, a siege Um, and it was the mechanization of war that um, dragged um, in wholesale industrial slaughter and um, pulled in the civilian populations and made it possible and indeed desirable or necessary to take out the manufacturing and industrial um, base otherwise you would never be able to defeat your enemies because they could keep repopulating and rebuilding the um, war machine and it's only after the horrors of it's not quite it's not the same and and some of it is that where we have the american government has backed off from the civilian thing the idea of just kill as many civilians as possible and demoralize the other side Um, and also the weapons are far more capable technically of doing that surgical strike. There's no such thing as a surgical strike in World War II from a p- prop plane <laughs> with looking through a bomb site and just dumping fire bombs, <laughs> generally try to hit the city that you were after, if they could find it with a compass and a sextant. You know? Which I, when I read this book in college and I was talking to someone about it, they were like, well, there's a theory that they bomb the wrong location. And I was like, what? And, and so that brings, you brought that up, well, you know, like, oh, there's no such thing as a surgical strike. And I was like, well, yeah, that, why else would they have everyone turn off their lights at night to make sure that that's not where the planes went to drop bombs? Clearly, it's not that precise if that's enough to, you know, possibly be passed over. Uh, so, yeah, it's not precise at all. It, it isn't. So, and yes, I, I'm not sure what I think about the idea that it was uh, an accident. I don't think it was an accident. Um, 
<laughs> myself. Uh, uh, two two nights in a row, by the way. Yeah, like, according to the movie, Julian. Yeah. And and no, it can't it can't be an accident that they would turn the lights off because yeah, keep in mind the technology and the navigation capabilities mm -hmm. at the time that they're they're launching out of probably England. I don't know for sure, but that's probably where they launched. From. Yeah, they were, and it Maybe. wasn't an accident by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you guys um, don't have the same um, historical memory of this uh, because you weren't directly bombed. I mean, this was going on in the UK as well. The Germans were doing it in the UK, mm -hmm. and it's a massive part of um, UK history. Um, everyone was blacked out. I mean, it was, um, you, you could be... Um, shot as a civilian for um leaving um light displaying out of your window like a crack of your window yeah. in one of the big cities um they took all of uh, the kids out the cities and then sent them out to total strangers uh, to live um out through the um through the war because of the indiscriminate bombing because mm -hmm. the accuracy was that yeah. poor and uh, they knew there were um industrial weapons factories in london birmingham manchester and bristol so they just carpet bombed those cities completely it, and you you just didn't know what you were hitting so you bombed absolutely everything and as a corollary to that you couldn't land if your bomb bays were full so you had to drop your bombs anyway so you may as well drop them over uh, a location where there was some chance of mm -hmm. doing some damage to your enemy I mean, it's the the yeah. um, there was very little morals, ethics, um, or reason and logic. It was just um, we have bombs, we will drop them. You are German, therefore mm -hmm. you you are a target. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So I I think like yeah, and technically, just the answer to that is no. It's it is physically impossible for that to be accident. That's. It, it's you can't fly all the way to Eastern Germany from London in the middle of the night with a sextant and a compass and find the wrong city. Like that's a, that's a amazing navigational feat to just do that period. So right. I'm a pilot. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> and a long distance <laughs> sailor. That's very tough. I know how to use a sextant. That's a very difficult problem <laughs> to do. And they managed to pull it off two nights in a row. Like, so yeah, that's, that's my answer. Sorry to get geeky, but like, no. Well, and nice. if it were an accident, the second night they would clearly know oh well that's the one we accidentally hit last night because the entire city is on fire like it's not like they could accidentally hit it <laughs> twice in a row oh, you know actually that's a good point so probably was not nowhere near as hard to find the second night right and there's no military and decentralized as well mm -hmm. um every single um plane had a navigator on board um right. so if someone is confused and going to the wrong city then you know uh fool me once fool me twice uh, fool me with an entire squadron of bombers mm -hmm. it doesn't fly and then two nights in a row so yeah it have... was it was de... carry on oh I, I was going to say i was wrong earlier that it was because of the change in military doctrine because apparently churchill knew they screwed up uh i i found a, that quote i was talking about i found the context of it he said uh he was speaking on february 13th of 1945 to the chiefs of staff committee and said it seems to me that the moment has come when the question of bombing of German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror, though other under other pretexts, should be reviewed. And then a little while later, he says, the destruction of Dresden remains a serious query against the conduct of Allied bombing. I am of the opinion that military objectives must henceforward be more strictly studied in our own interests than that of the enemy. Um... I feel the need for more precise concentration upon military objectives rather than on mere acts of terror and wanton destruction, however impressive. So it wasn't a change in military doctrine. I was wrong. They they knew exactly what they were doing at the time. Uh, although, well, I, I guess you could argue that the military doctrine at the time justified terror, but he knew, like, even at the time, he, it seems as though Churchill was thinking, yeah, we screwed up by doing that. And and it may be I'm just guessing here, but because it wasn't a military town, the Nazis may not have expected that. And for the Allies to put that much effort, I mean that is a huge cost in maybe lost other uses for those bombs, right? But there was probably I'm just guessing probably very little anti aircraft fire there. Like it wasn't a military city, it wasn't really involved in the war before. Yeah, that. I, I actually that looked that up. They did it they yeah. had uh 
well, we hadn't touched Dresden. That's why all the refugees went there. It was almost operating like a normal city until we firebombed it. But because the war was already turning, um, they had pulled all the anti-aircraft artillery out of Dresden and placed it other places that they thought were in bigger danger. So Dresden basically had nothing to protect itself. I mean, so it I is terrorism. Prop- I think it's fair to call that terrorism. Mm-hmm. That propaganda at the beginning, Juliet, that that you played was that was that um, authentic wartime propaganda? Oh yeah, I found it in the British. They have like an archive website. American side has one too, and they like basically identical. Like it's newsreel footage. I actually also had one. It's longer. Maybe I can. I'll dump the link in chat um but i found one that it's the u.s air force and it says that it's secret like it not to be distributed right on it i was gonna say the because that pro- because the propaganda made it sound like you know dresden bombed to adams we got him uh, th- i mean well, but that's before the that, war something was over, similar happened I could see them like being like, "Yay, look, we have a win," you know, before it actually ended. But then maybe, I don't know. I think it's just well, one of those things they didn't want people to understand what we did there. I mean, something similar happened much more recently, though, during the Falklands War, when the HMS <clears throat> Conqueror, which is a British submarine, sank an Argentine ship. They they printed a picture of I, some British newspaper. I think it was the Sun printed a picture of the ship sinking with the headline "Gotcha." Gotcha. And and then yeah, and then after that they replaced it because it was considered in poor taste and replaced it with something saying, "Did we drown a thousand argies?" Like oh oh sorry uh, yeah that was mean. So uh-huh. I think this tendency to to celebrate a victory and slap your legs and whoop and then go oh oops I was kind of being a dickhead there is something that has been done more than once. Oh right. It's more existential for the UK as well. I mean um, the onslaught um, during the during 1941, um, England was that close to being overrun. Um, uh, the uh, U-boats surrounding uh, the British Isles were um, taking out an obscene number of um, the cargo ships. Um, we were pretty much close to starvation as well as um, having no uh, material to create uh, enough weapons to defend ourselves. You wander around um, the British countryside now, you can still see um, pillboxes. These weird little um, concrete uh, boxes mm-hmm. with uh, murder holes on them. They're all over the place. And you'll see them by the side of um, roads, by the side of canals, by the side of anywhere that might have been um, the site of um, the German advancement in case of invasion. It was that close. And it was after 1941, the Battle of Britain, um, where the um, the Royal Air Force turned back the Luftwaffe, that um, it, it went from being... You know, we are about to be wiped off the face of the earth into we have a chance. And then obviously that's when the uh, how you guys um, joined the Second World War as well. And, and then, you know, things changed very much so. But in such a circumstance, you know, we're going to be wiped out. So we'll just bomb your cities out of existence, civilians and all. And it doesn't seem as um, much terrorism, though the guys in charge, they knew it was terrorism. They knew that's what they were trying to do. They were killing women, children, and the poor little horses as well. Um, not I, just I soldiers and not just... You can say that it, maybe it was more forgivable for uh, the British to have that attitude since they were under direct existential threat by the Germans. Now, it's interesting because if you look at propaganda in the United States, they dehumanize the Japanese or are much more aggressive toward the Japanese and toward the Germans. Now, the modern way of evaluating that, of course, is to put it under a racial lens the way we do fucking everything and say it's because of racism toward the Japanese. And while that was probably part of it, I think our the extra uh, sort of... Uh, the, the extra excessive aggression toward the Japanese might be due to the fact that unlike the Germans, the Japanese had been able to attack us directly. The, the, so, you know, the fact that we had actually lost people to Japanese weaponry, Japanese bombs had actually killed Americans, I think was probably, probably would have explained a lot of the, um, the, the excessive bloodthirst toward the Japanese in particular. 
Right. Well, I didn't make just... note. Of... Sorry, Julia. Uh, I didn't make note, but um, there was the um, quote from the American president talking about um, the nuclear exchange on um, Japan, saying how much of a success it was and how um, they would continue bombing uh, the Japanese out of existence. Um, I think you're right. It's 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 not looking at things through um, a, the contemporary racial lens. It's just you are. Um, call you Japanese, you are the enemy, um, you're the bad guys, we will blow you up with nuclear weapons because we've had them, we've got these um, weapons of war that are, are 20,000 times more powerful than conventional bombs. Um, so it's the same shock and awe and indiscriminate um, murder because it, for exactly the reason you gave, um, it was more of an existential threat to um, the American existence rather than just the military lives um, being um, expended in the European and African theatres. Yeah, I would say also the the Pacific theater. I mean, just we just kept throwing numbers at it to like inch our way through the islands. The Japanese were very difficult to fight. Not to say that we weren't didn't fight hard, hard in Europe, but the Japanese there was like a level of brutality that on um, both sides to gain ground in the Pacific and I mean if it weren't for Midway we would have lost like right then and there basically so I think it was almost like the the bombing in Japan it was kind of a we have a leg up here and this is our only chance of ending this before we just kind of both fight until we're extinct um but here so uh one of the other questions that i had was um it was from like a video i was watching on youtube actually and they just posed this question that the aliens okay the aliens in the book don't have time like time is not linear and they don't believe in free will and it was like how does that apply Billy Pilgrim and war in general. I thought it was a really interesting aspect because if you don't have free will, you're not really responsible for anything you do because you had no choice in the matter, right? So, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, that is slightly a military thing they do is that you follow the orders given to you by your commander, period. It's not up to you to be making decisions because then nothing would ever move forward. So there's that aspect, but then just in general in life, you know, um, like, I guess the, so it goes, it could kind of be like, well, I had no say in the matter. I didn't make these decisions. This just happened. And it was always going to happen this way. It's just like an interesting th thing. I feel like it's, it help. It's a helpful coping mechanism for being through like an extended traumatic experience with so much death, just like horrible things happening, um, that it absolves you of any involvement, kind of. Well, I mean, a lot of what Billy Pilgrim experiences is kind of out of his control, mm -hmm. like especially the the war parts. Like he's, um, like especially once he's a POW, because it's like, what, what do you do at that point? You're literally a prisoner. Like when you're a soldier, you're under command. Um, and I know uh, like when it came to the trials after uh, World War II was over, they were like, oh no, that doesn't give you the, it's, you can't just say you were following orders. That's, we're not right. gonna let that fly anymore. But like, once you're literally a POW, what can you do? you you literally are a prisoner at that point you can't like go above to a higher commander and say hey they want me to do this horrible thing like no you're you're being you're captured by supposedly your enemy and they're going to make you do whatever the hell they want you to do even if it's mostly extremely dehumanizing mm -hmm. um like he he ends up in dresden by no choice of his own he experienced the bombing of Dresden. Ha he he has no actual hand in how it happens. Um, Derby dying. Uh, everyone's stealing, but and, and Derby dies. 
and like n- he has no control in any of those situations so yeah so it goes is the best he can do mm-hmm. uh, it's when it's when he's outside of war when it's like well now you have more control over your life and but he he doesn't feel like he does it, he still acts like so it goes like he literally says that he's mentally ill be- and one of the reasons why he is mentally ill is because he wants to marry this fat woman and he proposed to her and she said yes and he's uh-huh. like this is a sign of my mental illness that's why i turned myself into the, the hospital and it, and i mean it's crazy but he still has that attitude that like he has no control over his life when he should have more control over his life once he's no longer in war but maybe having experienced war as a prisoner of war has made him feel like it doesn't that they're all the most important things in life he won't have control over life and death he, there's no way for him to control that so he just has to accept it maybe that's why but it it's really dark <laughs> too yeah i i don't really recall him making a lot of decisions throughout the book he's kind of like ushered from place to place so he's mm-hmm. told to do things and he just kind of you know accepts it and does what he's told and you know doesn't really have any motivation for anything that he does like even like proposing like i don't know what the motivation was for him proposing to his fiance because he didn't seem to <laughs> care for her much and you know she was eating uh, candy bars all the damn time but uh yeah and i was going to ask about that too like did it maybe i missed it but did it ever like go into what his motivation was for joining the uh the army or whatever he was in or they just kind of jump into him being assigned to a unit and then like it being like destroyed and like he was lost in the woods Mm -hmm. i looked up after i read it to find out if he was drafted or joined but i saw he joined voluntarily while he was in college well, so, but but Billy of... Pilgrim, it, you get the impression maybe he was drafted, right? But yeah, I don't recall ever, like G-Man brought up, I don't recall him ever contemplating two different options to figure out which one he should do. Like That never happens anywhere in the book. Mm-hmm. And like I said That's about right. the time question that he asked, like, I just see it as inevitable, like, that's kind of what, like, it's already been decided. He brings up the story of the Trafalgarians, talk mm-hmm. about how they destroy the universe and they just think he's silly because he said he wants to go back to earth and explain to people how a society can live in peace. And they just think that's funny. They're amused by that. And we're like, well, no, that's how earth is like time's already decided to a tropical mm-hmm. area. And they know when the universe is going to end. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, there's a, there's a Greek philosopher named Parmenides. I, yeah, of course. Uh, There's a Greek philosopher named Parmenides who had this idea that nothing ever changes, right? There's no such thing as change. The passage Mm -hmm. of time is an illusion. Everything's locked in. So basically, Parmenides is a trial from a Dorian. (laughs) That's what his philosophy is. And this has actually, in Western philosophy, has a very, very long history, at least two and a half thousand years, of what's called eternalism, which is basically the belief that trial from a Dorians are right. That that's how time actually works. And this sensation of it as moving is is purely an illusion. It, it actually doesn't move at all. Um, so I, I, I think I, I would be interested to know how, whether Kurt Vonnegut formulated this idea independently or if he read this somewhere or some got this idea from somewhere else. And... And it also, it raises the question, like, if the trial from Adorian see everything, does that mean there's no free will? Like, is is watching someone doing something the same as predicting they're going to do it? Well, I mean, that's an interesting thing. That's something that I've had to kind of ponder my whole life. Because being when I was younger, I was raised, like, <clears throat> very Christian. And according to the Bible, God is, like... Um, you know, like he knows everything that's going to happen from the beginning to the end of time, right? Therefore, do you have free will because he already knows what you're going to do? But it's one of those funny things because, but if you don't know what you're going to do and then you do it and he knew you were going to do that, does that not like, does that mean you don't have free will? 
Well, it's kind of like the idea of fate or destiny, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that it's easy to say, you know, things that have happened in the past were fated to happen because you already know what's happened. So it's not like you, you can't say that your individual choices didn't shape the future, though. You know, it's just like a fancy way of saying, well, you know, it, it happened. So it was always destined to happen. Well, right. that, not necessarily. It may well, just be a coping like you know, mechanism in Christianity that survived for 2000 years. Cause it does work pretty good for some people. Mm -hmm. You hear the answer, like something totally crazy, like this entire book. And the Christian answer to that is that's part of God's plan. And if you say, <laughs> why that's dumb, that's stupid. Like, are you saying God is stupid? They don't like it. If you ask that, but <laughs> like that well, is a coping mechanism. It's a psychological coping mechanism. And the mm -hmm. fact that it survived for 2000 years, I think is part of proving that it works. Well, the thing is, though, is that I would say that predeterminism uh, exists on a metaphysical scale, but we don't exist at that scale. Our brains don't exist at that scale. Uh, we interact on the in within the human context. So it's fun to think about it. But at the same time, you are responsible for your actions and you need to be held responsible for your actions. Mm -hmm. So, um, like... It is true that some things are out of your control. Like if you were in the bombing of Dresden as a POW, you had no say in that. But you did have control over the idea that maybe I should have checked to see if the horses were bleeding. That was the little bit of control I did have and I fucked that up. Mm -hmm. See, that's the thing. Like, so to me, I'm sort of like, yeah, it, they, sure, determinism exists. Everything is already decided because but it's outside of our scale to understand it or for it to matter to us so it doesn't matter what matters is that you punched another human being and now you're in trouble for it that's what matters and uh and i think that's not a um duality a lot of people are willing to accept uh they're like oh no if everything's predetermined that means that i am and anything i do doesn't matter and it's like well then uh, stop existing entirely because <laughs> at that point I don't care about your opinion anymore because you've given up any kind of human context so I don't need to exist with you on a human context there are plenty of uh, physicists and philosophers of modern science that are suggesting that um, the passage of time thing is is just a viewpoint um, and it's that is encoded into our human way of experiencing the world, but that doesn't mean it is correct and total. And we would have to be able to see in more dimensions to be able to um, perceive things um, in a more true um, manner. I think he um, pulled it out in the novel uh, in that um, bit uh, on page 61. Um, when the bombers get back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where the factory is operating night and day, dismantle the cylinders, separating dangerous contact, contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground, to hide them cleverly so they would never hurt anybody ever again. So that's time running backwards and it's just a viewpoint, but the, the one is um, annihilation and destruction and the other is um, careful caretaking. And um, we've got, you know, contemporary scientists suggesting that this isn't just um, philosophical um, thinking, but potentially an aspect of, well, they call it multiverse and whatever, don't they? Mm -hmm. I found that pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, I still don't think, I, I guess I just don't see why it would invalidate free will, though, because let's... And free will is one of those interesting philosophical debates because it's one of the ones that people are actually invested in. On either side, people who believe in free will are really vociferous about it, and people who don't believe in free will are also really invested. And it, it seems like both sides have some really deep-seated psychological reason for wanting to believe what they do. I suspect it has to do with either wanting to be held responsible or not wanting to. Um. But I, I have to ask the question, even if time were illusory, 
I, I guess what's the difference between I choose something at a certain point in the future and I'm always choosing it. Either way, it's still a choice. You know, whether or yeah. I don't think he looks at time as illusionary. It's just that it's perceived two different ways. So humans perceive it as this linear thing that started here and goes to here. And the Trafagorians, because they can perceive the fourth dimension, they understand that they can see all the different parts. But it's interesting. I mean, it, it's part of that same thing. I think that fourth dimension is another version of what you brought up, that, that there's another multiverse, right? It's the same kind of thing. But I like that he uses the fourth dimension a bunch of times to explain why something isn't obvious or doesn't, you know, including the sexes, you know, which is a little side. But I thought that's like the best argument for that there's actually more than two genders that I've ever seen is his concept that there's actually five sexes in humans. But because the sexual activity of the other three sexes takes place entirely in the fourth dimensions, humans can't perceive it and they're not aware that it's happening. <laughs> I can't. I can't argue with that one. Like, okay, maybe there are more than maybe there are there five are, genders. There are physical theories that say that there are some extra dimensions that we don't experience, but the idea is they're really tiny. So you can move in a different direction, but you have to be like subatomic to do it. it it's fun to play with, you know. Technically, you know, if you take, I don't know how many people here have taken like relativity and quantum mechanics in college, but yeah, they try to get into that different. Like, can you tell? And what would what would really happen if that happened? But yeah, nobody knows. But it's fun to speculate. I'm an electrical engineer with uh, physics and astrophysics is my minor. So they talked about it, but nobody really knows. It's fun to speculate. Mm -hmm. I was just going to go back to what Caleb was saying about free will. And um, I think uh, my biggest argument in support of there being free will is always like, you know, we're not we don't act on instinct and, and that's evidenced by the fact that humans will continually make decisions that are not in their best interest, you know, like it's not furthering their own survival. So that, you know, the fact that they make these bad decisions, you know, that's what tells me that there's free will. I don't know what you guys think about that. It's all in God's plan. The fact that you don't understand it, just proves that God exists. To my mind, the idea that people do things against their own self-interest is somewhat borne out by the, the idea that your brain does not believe in the future for the most part. It believes that it has to survive the next 10 seconds. Um, so it also believes that it should get the things at once in the next 10 seconds. So to me, that is, uh, that's not, conducive to long-term thinking which would be is when is in your actual thus self-interest like a lot of people don't save for the future a lot of people do drugs because it's in, immediately uh uh pleasurable and or have sex with someone they probably shouldn't you know uh th those kinds of things so to me i'm sort of like we are we're we're actually fighting our brain's idea that we won't exist in the next like 10 minutes at any given point. Uh, so like, we're always going to have to be fighting that. You know, we're so conscien conscious and self-aware that a lot of us do get past it, but it's the reason why people still don't make good decisions even for something that will take place three months down the line or a year down the line. So I do think we're mostly instinctual but there is the free will part of it comes into play when we're doing things long term. That's when we're our most human, I think, uh, is when we're actually planning for the future. Because animals don't plan for uh, the future beyond like the next season. You know, that's as far as they go. Um, like, oh, I, I stored up some food for winter, or, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> I, I think we're that's when we're our most uh, aware of our humanity is when we're planning for the future. I think that, you know, there, there's a sort of, um, in the first place, I think that there's a fallacy that you have to be careful of. It's called a genetic fallacy, which is the idea that if someone postulates something, I can go, oh, well, you just, you're just saying that because you want that to be true. The thing is, that doesn't actually affect the truth value of their statement. 
if someone says the sky is blue, I can say, oh, you desperately want the sky to be blue. However, regardless of whether they do or not, it doesn't really affect whether their proposition is true or not. So, you know, criticizing someone's motivations doesn't really count as a criticism of their position, at least not in most cases. There are cases maybe in like complicated political or social things where it does, but not when it comes to metaphysics, right? Which is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And this is metaphysics when you get into stuff, speculations like this. Now, I, I, I think that what you were saying about us being the freest when we're planning long term, uh, there's there's a scene in Derek Yarman's movie Wittgenstein, which is a biopic on the life of that philosopher, where he says, uh, a dog may be expecting him his master to come. Why can't he be expecting him to come next Wednesday? Is it because he doesn't have language? And, and it's kind of an interesting thought that we aren't, like you said, your brain isn't really conscious of the future as such. But we can talk to ourselves about it, and that's why we can do these long-term things. That's interesting. I mean, this is one of those things that's always really hard for me to wrap my brain around because to me, like, there's no, like, you can't even argue that free will exists because, like, I, I make decisions all day long. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, like, I, I feel like you could argue whether certain animals have any kind of free will, but I think once you're sentient, you're making decisions. Yeah, animals have free will. They do have free will, but they're mm -hmm. um, they operate a lot more in instinct. And they also most animals don't do deferred gratification, which is right. basically how you measure IQ in a person. That's the easiest way to measure IQ. They're, you know, strongest factor. If you're going to measure IQ in a one year old, that's how you measure it. Animals just don't do that. Uh -huh. they, they they don't understand except for you know and squirrels may instinctively have don't, acorn. they don't even understand the instinct that they do i'll say just like even with the geese when they're nesting or something i think like sometimes they seem confused right now the one goose <laughs> just like trying to mate with lemon grab and lemon grab is like all right let's try this out and like uh with the new goose hope and i and i still don't know if hope is a boy or girl but it's just kind of like they have to test they're figuring it out though and like who's going to be on top here like they and that's what I'm mean, grabbing two. He went through, but like that's so. I think you know the hormones and instinct, and they have no idea. Even when two, he's like nesting, and she's. I think she gets confused. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I still putting straw around me when I'm not breeding anymore? Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever had a cat or a dog. Like they're usually female that um. They will carry around like stuffed toys and groom them and. Like, it's like they have, like, an instinct to have a baby, and they don't know what to do. So they just, like, have a toy baby. We used to have a dog like that. I know people that do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's theory and, and, of mind as well, isn't it? Uh -huh. That's what my Sorry, cat is, so. right? Yeah. Surrogate baby? Toy baby? Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah, we've cat, got new, new puppy. Them. Oh. And uh, we're we're out and about with her, and um, we're interacting with uh, loads of random dogs. And um, you can see that she's behaving like an absolute tool, jumping up and trying to bite them and whatever. And they're not responding in the same way that they would with other um, adult dogs because they realise she's a baby. So mm -hmm. it's an instinct thing, but is that free will, or is there is no theory of mind there? They're not thinking about it they're just aware that she is a little tiny thing and so don't immediately break its spine and chew it all up um so i think it's, you know, it's a trait i, I was gonna say it's a trait current. that uh, evolutionarily developed that it it's a successful trait and mm -hmm. you see animals actually recognize young in other species they can mm -hmm. even tell that this is a baby in another species and you see a i've seen it with dogs and cats like they know to like not mess with a puppy or, or mm -hmm. a kitten, like a, an adult dog that's very aggressive. I think they can tell that it's a kitten. So you don't mess with the kitten. You just kind of push it away. But it, it, it's instinctive though. Like cats, they decide to go somewhere. I had cats. Like how many times you see the cat just like get up and like, like, Oh shit, something, is there a siren going off? The cat like bolts to some other room and then goes, like there's no idea why it went to the other room. And then it just <laughs> like licks itself. It has to act nonchalant, right? If you say, what are you doing? It like pretends it went in there to, to groom or something. It, it is kind of hilarious. Cats get embarrassed. 
they they mm-hmm. do they if they screw up they will get embarrassed by the way if you point and laugh at a cat if a if people in a room all point and laugh at a cat, the cat will start grooming nervously because it knows it's being made fun of. Yeah, they're a lot smarter than we uh, we assume. They, That's they can so get embarrassed. Sad. I know, like don't torture it that way. I don't That's ever mean. do that. That's mean. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. But it apparently it works. Um, but yeah, like uh, another thing though is that cats can cats dream and dogs dream. Like there there are, but usually what's going on there is that they're like playing out. And this is the thing that like humans' brains do when we're asleep. They're trying to problem solve and think about like, okay, if I'm chasing a rabbit and it goes this way, what do I do? How, like you know, because it's sort of like the sports thing of visualizing. You know, mm-hmm. you visualize doing it over and over and over again, and it increases the likelihood that you'll be able to do it well. And when human bre- beings sleep, we also problem solve. Only our problems sometimes are about like interpersonal issues, it's stuff at work, and you know, solving mathematical problems and working on you know papers and writing and everything. So it's like a lot. It's it's a lot less uh, animalistic, but that's what dreaming is dreaming is problem solving which is why i i I don't understand the the modern student who sleeps like two hours a day (laughs) i'm like that's not gonna help yeah that'll help me out when i'm trying to figure out uh, how to get away from a monster when i'm floating a a foot off the ground that's what i was thinking being chased by like jack-o-lanterns and stuff too (laughs) like i had nightmares all the time growing up like what was i problem solving yeah well, here's how Your I solve fears. it in my dreams. I like get on all fours and that helps me get, you know, contact with the ground better. I got murdered a lot. I don't know. I, con- I wasn't consciously thinking about getting killed, but like I remember in an alleyway, like a guy swinging a chain around and that killed me, like all kinds of death. <laughs> hmm. Tell me my, what my dreams are. Memory processing as well for um, dreams, isn't it? Um, that's something I've been looking into recently. I've got a little one and uh, she stopped napping. And the conventional wisdom is uh, they stop napping when the hippocampus develops enough that basically their random access memory is uh, bigger so that they can process more during waking times. Otherwise, they literally have to get asleep because they, they stop working. <laughs> oh. Quite amusing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that kind of rolls back into the book because my interpretation of the aliens is that in his old age, after the plane crash, Billy Pilgrim is kind of, he's like, it's not slipping through time. His brain is just kind of like falling apart. Um, I've seen it with older people with dementia where they start mixing and combining memories and people. Like one, say they have three granddaughters. Now all three of those granddaughters is one person and all memories with them are like morphed to fit that. So it's almost like it was a a dream caused by the guy in the hospital that told him to read Kilgore Trout and his brain just started morphing his memories and making them easier to cope with. Like uh, that, like the being a POW instead of being a POW in absolutely horrendous conditions where he's being mocked and ridiculed all the time, he's a prized possession in a zoo that's you know not bad living, and they give him a mate that's way prettier than his wife, and she likes him, <laughs> like all that kind of stuff. Um, that's just like my second reading. That's kind of the interpretation I came to is that Billy pilgrim's mind is slipping and now he's jumbled everything in his life through this lens of a sci-fi novel yeah, he says when he was in the zoo that he has a huge dong or two so i don't know if that's like, <laughs> everything is cope. better yeah, yeah. <laughs> i thought that was a really funny detail <laughs> when i got to it i was like, okay all right really pilgrim I first read this this book around the year that Kurt Vonnegut died, around two, I think 20, 2007. Mm-hmm. I was 17, and that was the one line I remembered word for word. He had a <laughs> tremendous wang, incidentally. You never know who'll get one. <laughs> oh. 
Um, okay, so in chat, somebody was asking about a poem in the front of the book, and like, I don't know if I have it in mine. Here we go. So, all right, chat, if this is what you're talking about, I guess, like the title page? Because the only other poem I have before chapter one is the, the, the little Lord Jesus poem. And it doesn't look like a bomb. <laughs> so I'm just going to see if that's it. Uh, they said there's a poem in the front of their copy that looks kind of like a nuke. Um, does anybody, do any of you guys have anything you wanted to bring up that we haven't touched on much? Uh, just that there were a couple of things that I thought he was setting up in the first chapter that I don't think he actually ever explored that, you know, kind of the transition from being a POW to like being a regular normal mm -hmm. civilian and like trying to find importance and like being an aging veteran and stuff like that. You know, I, I thought he was going to go there a little more in depth, but I don't, I don't think he ever did. So I thought that would have been an e interesting way to go too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's a good point. Like he really doesn't get into that. There's a lot of different I ideas in there. I'm not, another one I remembered was he, he talked about Crimea being used as a pawn in, in the war, which they're using as a pawn right now. Again, uh -huh. like I read that part and I went, is that what he's talking about? And I went back and listened to it again. Like, yeah, it's about how somebody, you know, somebody new was there. Um, there's so much in this that I think I'm going to listen to the whole thing again. Third mm -hmm. time. I, I learned way more the second time. I already kind of understood what was going on. And mm -hmm. so it, it didn't, it wasn't like I wasn't constantly going, what, what, what is this? What is that? Like, <laughs> like it helped to read it a second time. Yeah. I think I probably need a third time to really get it. And it's a good book. I would encourage anybody that hasn't read it or listened to, and it doesn't take that long. I li I'd listen to the entire thing again in two days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, where did it go? My chat is being really wonky. Uh, awesome one says, what does Dresden have to do with the book? I was going to suggest awesome one. Please watch the video from the beginning. The recorded <laughs> version will be. Juliet goes into that in detail. Sorry to be a yeah. little facetious, but yeah, you went into that in detail in the intro. I did. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's it's still mind-boggling to me that for as much World War II history as I've consumed in my life, either in school or just myself. I mean, I have a whole shelf somewhere over here that's all World War II. Oh, no, it's over there. But um, that I didn't know about it until 2019 when i read it, this book that's just it, wild it makes, to me to me it's number one it's an admission of guilt mm -hmm. so the people who write history also the winners write the history books like basically that's true always um and so i think it means that they know that was not a good thing to do so they don't tell anybody they don't tell the kids i had right. a uh a my um, political science professor a, in American history, like freshman year, his first day of class was, your assignment is to go home and forget everything you ever learned about American history in grammar school and high school, because it only had one point, and that was to make you love your country. And then when you come in on Wednesday, I'm going to start at the beginning and tell you what actually happened. That's hmm. pretty astounding at 18 to hear that. Right. And then I realized <laughs> that he was true. Actually, I think yeah. it was to make you love your government is actually what he meant. But. Uh, yeah. And the guy, um, I think I might have mentioned it before, but yeah, it was Paris Glendening who uh, later became a two-term governor of Maryland. Um, huh. He didn't say that when he was governor. <laughs> really? That's so cool. Yeah, I sat in his office because I was one of the ones that would ask. It was a big class, and I would go after class once in a while and sat in his office and ask him questions. And then another another aside with that, like I graduated in '84, um, I didn't find out what political party he was until he ran for governor. I lived in Maryland then. That's, he he didn't disclose that, but anyway, that's what he said, and I think it's actually true. And mm -hmm. it explains this, and it explains that they are guilty. They know. And they would rather not tell kids this story. So it's not in the books. 
Do you think that there is a pendulum swing, swing the other way now that maybe some of these the classes are designed to make you hate your country? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's a good point. It's actually exactly the same thing. In other words, history has an agenda. Uh -huh. So if you go to a government school and I, it applies through college, um, I think when I went to college, it was less prevalent in college, period. But I still didn't learn about Dresden. Uh, now, yeah, I agree. And it's the same thing, really. They're making you hate your government or hate Western civilization, right? It's the whole point of unsafe space. Yeah, I don't think they're making around. you hate your government. I think they're making you hate your country right now. Like, like yeah. maybe, and, but actually, I think they still want you to love your government. They want you to love <laughs> your government. Yes, they didn't yeah. change that part. Yeah, They want no. you to hate Western civilization. Yes, that's a good way. To well, it, it's part and parcel of any revolutionary regime to make you want to love your government and hate your history. Uh -huh. So, so the whole point of history in high school is basically Stockholm syndrome. They're, they're keeping you. <laughs> Gosh, it just, it makes me think, I mean, if for the most part, we didn't know about the uh, Dresden until this book and only because it just so happens that a guy that became a popular novelist survived the bombing in Dresden. What else don't we know about? Yes. It's gonna like send what me down a rabbit me? hole. And this is something from World War II. Mm -hmm. like, how about what they're doing right now? Oh gosh. That we don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think part of that is like we've gotten so far from the history of what like really happened and the truth and the details. People just kind of accept what they're told as fact. Mm -hmm. and they don't really investigate it any further. So, you know, they think that they're telling the truth about, you know, what they're teaching other people. Yep. Well, this is a depressing end. <laughs> <laughs> Can talk more about goose, about geese mating if you want. <laughs> Get a little graphic. So, what about um, the American Nazi in the uh, in the book? Uh, Camp uh, W. Campbell. Uh, he comes out with a nice one. You're going to have to fight the communists sooner or later," said Campbell. "Why not get it over with now?" Currently fighting them. Yep. Look at that. Yeah, this this book is really a lot deeper than it is on the surface. I definitely got way more out of it the second reading. Because it is so crazy. It's like a scatter plot. Um but I have to say I, I admi admire Kurt Vonnegut after reading it. I appreciate his perspective on the reality of war. I mean, we all love a good hero story, but there's been a recent shift, like recentism in the past few years, also in war movies coming out of Hollywood, like 1917 and Dunkirk are not hero movies. Well, 1917 a little bit, but they're very much more about the reality and the misery of war than Saving Private Ryan was. Has Maybe anybody it's... read another Kurt Vonnegut book that they would recommend? I, I have this first I one I read. No. Since I found out, unfortunately, this morning that the, the Kurt, uh, Kilgore Trout is not actually real. <laughs> but there's a book. I'm just thinking about getting it for 20 bucks. <laughs> I, I read well, that I, there was a there was a dispute. Yeah, somebody wrote this book, Venus on the Half Shell, by and they it's published as Kilgore Trout. That's hilarious. And then after it was published, he intended to write another one. He was going to write one of the other ones. And apparently, this is a book in some other Kurt Vonnegut story that he developed the idea. And somebody wrote a science fiction book based on the concept. But then they had a disagreement. Um, Kurt Vonnegut had a disagreement with the person who actually wrote this. I don't remember his name because the cover of the book says it's written by Kilgore Trout. Pretty funny. <laughs> and it's available in hardback and paperback, by the way. Um, but they had a disagreement over the, the concept. So Kurt Vonnegut didn't want him to write any more books under the name Kilgore Trout. So the guy didn't. Uh, wow. 
<laughs> it's <laughs> nice. Scary. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, how um, can you not? How can you stop that? But mm -hmm. other than the one which is apparently not real, where I saw the on Goodreads the complete works of Kilgore Trout. <laughs> it's five dollars. That's funny. <laughs> and I didn't buy it because I don't. Think it's... <laughs> Maybe he was afraid Kilgore Trout would be a successful writer, so it wouldn't be true to the lore. Yeah, yeah. Like, you can't sell too oh. many books. <laughs> it is his idea, right? They're his concepts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he came up with the idea of Kilgore Trout, so, like, unless he gives someone permission to use that, they are plagiarizing, technically. So, like, like it is <clears throat> his. I'm mean, taking a storyline. <laughs> like, like, even, even the story. The name? Yeah, um, he could, he could have, and he, he I mean, and also the story, the, even the, the, the fake stories that Kilgore Trout supposedly wrote within uh, Kurt Vonnegut's novels, um, because it's in, it's not just in Slaughterhouse Five, Kilgore Trout, Kilgore Trout is in other books of Kurt Vonnegut's. Like any of those things are also technically still Kurt Vonnegut's ideas and just writing them is, like kind of plagiarism like once he's in public domain though fair game anyone could pretend to be Kilgore Trout and mm -hmm. write these stories that's absolutely true um that, like but he's not in public domain so it's still okay. technically his even though so you have dead. to wait you have to wait <laughs> and I haven't looked up yet but I am going to find out is is actually Trafador a real plant you know <laughs> it's it says he, it's in i looked it up it's in the great magellan cloud he doesn't say uh -huh. that in this book but in one of his other books he he says where trafalgar is <laughs> i don't have all the star systems in the great magellan cloud memorized <laughs> that's awesome it's fun it's funny yeah i like that kind of stuff so yeah um, I, don't, I i don't know of any i mean i know there are other kurt vonnegut books but as I know I've never talked to anyone who's read one. The book is great. Yeah, I, I liked it. it a lot. Um, Cat's Cradle, uh, Alan in chat just said Cat's Cradle. I've at least heard of that. So you, they've brought up Cat's Cradle, Bluebeard, Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, Breakfast oh, yep. of Champions. Um, apparently, according to JEC, Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, and Breakfast of Champions compliment Slaughterhouse Five. A lot of the same characters pop up in them. Interesting. Um, okay. So yeah, like it, the thing is, that he wrote a lot. Of, he, I mean, he has a lot of novels, and most of them are about the same size. So it's it probably wouldn't be hard to get through most of Vonnegut's um, novels mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're all about the same size. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any last thoughts before we wrap up? No. Okay. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here. This was a great conversation. I'm glad that everybody seems to have pretty much enjoyed the book. I think it's it's a really fun and interesting read. Um, not going to do a lot of housekeeping this time because I honestly would probably give you false information, <laughs> but in, we aren't positive about next week month's book, but we're tentatively it's going to be the girl with the dragon tattoo we'll update you like this week for sure but um i look forward to seeing everybody next month and thank you again everybody in the panel and chat um and we will see you soon bye bye Thanks for sticking around until the end. If you're new to Unsafe Space, check out our deep content library that includes discussions with everyone from James Lindsay to Brett Weinstein. And please consider helping to fund our work by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on a variety of social media platforms, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space Discord server which is open to financial supporters at any level. We hope to see you there. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. It would be better for your health if you forgot what you just heard.
that should be easy for someone of your intelligence. The following co-conspirators are hereby ordered to watch CNN. Experts agree that 87,000 new tax collectors will make inflation feel like less of a problem. I think we can agree that the FBI's track record speaks for itself. If you think about it, only government sanctioned experts should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.